All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. This is Left Bank Books Welcome's beloved, award-winning, and best-selling author, Jewel Parker Rhodes. We'll discuss her new book, Paradise on Fire. And at this point, I'm going to welcome Cliff onto the screen as well. Hello. And hello. <laughs> uh, Cliff and I will be in conversation with Jewel after a presentation. We are both huge fans of Jewel's and are very excited for this event today. <laughs> Left Bank Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the supporters of Jewel Parker Rhodes, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. We offer in-store shopping, curbside pickup, and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. We are very happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoyed this event, and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing a signed copy for you or for your friends at left-bank.com. Jewel was so kind to send us signed book plates that we have available for books purchased from Left Bank Books. And when you purchase from Left Bank Books, that allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating. It also allows us to keep offering incredible author events like this one. So thank you so much for your support. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis, including the incredible, the amazing Cliff Helm, children's department manager, children's specialist extraordinaire. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, at the end of the event. So you can type your questions as a comment, and you can do that at any point in time as you think of a question. And be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook and YouTube to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events. And now, about today's book, Paradise on Fire. From award-winning and best-selling author Jewel Parker Rhodes comes a powerful coming-of-age survivor survival tale exploring issues of race, class, and climate change. Addie is haunted by the tragic fire that killed her parents, leaving her to be raised by her grandmother. Now, years later, Addie's grandmother has enrolled her in a summer wilderness program. There, Addie joins five other Black City kids, each with their own troubles, to spend a summer out west. Deep in the forest, the kids learn new, and to them, strange skills. Camping, hiking, rock climbing, and how to start and safely put out campfires. Most important, they learn to depend upon each other for companionship and survival. But then comes a devastating forest fire. Addie is face to face with her destiny and haunting past, developing her courage and resiliency against the raging fire. It's up to Addie to lead her friends to safety. Not all are saved, but remembering her origins and grandmother's teachings She's able to use street smarts, wilderness skills, and her spiritual intuition to survive. And about our speaker. Jewel Parker Rhodes is the author of Ninth Ward, winner of a Coretta Scott King Award, Sugar, winner of the Jane Addams Children's Book Award, and the New York Times bestselling Ghost Boys, as well as Bayou Magic, Towers Falling, Black Brother, Black Brother, and Paradise on Fire. She has written many award not award-winning novels for adults, including Magic City, a novel about the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Jewel is the Virginia G. Piper Endowed Chair of Creative Writing at Arizona State University. And now, without further ado, I am so happy and proud to welcome one of my favorite authors to host ever, Jewel Parker Rhodes for Left Bank Books. If you would please all help me in giving a giant round of applause wherever you are, Jewel, hello! Hello, hello. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm honored to be here today. Uh, I'm honored because Left Bank Books has a special place in my heart. When I was a young novelist writing my first book, the first bookstore I ever went to was Left Bank Books. So to return again and again is just a pleasure. The other thing is that I love St. Louis and I love St. Louis kids. And maybe when this pandemic is all over with, I could come out and be hosted by Left Bank Books and I can see all of you in person and ask your permission if I can give you a hug because I'm a hugging kind of person. <laughs> this is also an honor because this is the very first presentation I'm giving for my book, 
paradise on fire. And so here it is for you. I have always, always wanted to write for children. Even when I was writing for books for adults, I was thinking about writing for children. So I really only wrote books for adults because I was practicing. I was just trying to become good enough to write for you guys. And it seems as though when disaster strikes that my creativity gets sparked. And when Hurricane Katrina happened to New Orleans, that was when I first got my call about 12 years ago to write Ninth Ward, my first children's book ever. Uh, so since then, I've been writing and writing, but Paradise on Fire is part of my connection to the environment that you'll find in Ninth Ward and Bayou Magic and really all my books that I worry about keeping our planet and our world safe so that you young people can grow up and enjoy it for your lifetime and your children's lifetime. So let's go to slide two, Paradise on Fire. I'm living out in Seattle, Washington right now. We've had wildfires. And a few years back, I was in California and experienced the smoke from the wildfires. These pictures are actually from the summer of 2019 and the summer of 2020. And it shows record-breaking dry conditions caused, you know, these horrific fires. But did you know that while some fires happen because of lightning strike, most fires happen because of people. They don't put out their campfire. Um, they have like the rim of their car cause a spark, which causes the wildfire to happen in these drought conditions. Or they have a gender reveal party, and that causes thousands upon thousands of acres of fires to be burned. And one of the things that my character Addie discovers too, besides losing these trees, which give us oxygen in our environment, we are also ruining the home for animals. And there you see the vet techs taking care of an animal that has been burned. Let's go to the next video, please. Turning now to weather out west, hurricane force winds have prompted urgent red flag fire warnings tonight in Southern California, where a new wildfire has forced tens of thousands from their homes. CBS's Jonathan Bigliotti reports tonight from the fire lines in Irving, California. The winds came with a vengeance, flames and thick smoke darkening the sky. This Southern California wildfire exploded in a matter of minutes. Residents ordered to get out. Evacuate residences for the Orange County Fire Authority. The flames being pushed by powerful Santa Ana winds, the strongest all year, gusts topping 70 miles per hour. The fire that started up in the hills, a big concern will be pushed into neighborhoods like this. Because the wind is so strong, there are no airdrops, so fire crews are on foot trying to stop these flames from spreading. They've already jumped two major highways. Erratic winds already taking a toll. Tonight, at least two first responders injured fighting this blaze. And this is what fire crews are up against tonight. A wall of flame and smoke being whipped around by these hurricane force winds. There is a neighborhood, believe it or not, on the other side of all this that fire crews right now simply can't get to. This fire event is expected to last through the night with more hurricane force winds until tomorrow afternoon. Nora. Jonathan Vigliotti, thank you. So you can see that fire is really a wild, raging monster. And when you saw the reporter with all the smoke, that smoke has all kinds of particulates that are very bad for your lungs. And in fact, when you don't experience the wildfire itself with just the smoke, as I did last summer up in Washington State, children with asthma, people with immunocompromised conditions, they all can't breathe. Last summer when I was finishing my writing, I would turn and look out my window and because of smoke in California, basically two states away, I literally could not see the streets. So it's very dangerous. But also one of the things that my character Addie likes is she likes to make maps and mazes. 
when she was a child, she had a fire event happen to her and she's haunted by it. So she's always trying to figure out how do I escape? How do I survive? How do I map my way out? But as you can see that if you have a road map, it's clear where you turn left, where you turn right. But if you're caught in a fire, the fire moves, the wind moves it. And it's much more difficult to figure out how to survive. Now I'm going to read for you the very beginning of my novel. And this is actually Addie on the airplane, getting ready to go to her wilderness adventure. There's always a way out, Grandma Booby whispers. Use your mind, your heart. Her arthritic fingers poke my chest. Closing my eyes, I smell her red bush tea. The shea butter she rubs on her skin. Her spirit is alive, urgent. But Grandma Beebe isn't here. Here is a packed airplane. The plane is leveling off, engines murmuring steadily. The bells, the seatbelt sign being soft. We're flying high. I grab my pencil and my notepad from my backpack and draw. I remember the flight attendant walking the aisle, pointing at emergency exits. I quickly sketch row after row. I block the front exit with an X. The closest exits are ahead of me. Row 18, exits on the airplane left and right. These are my escape doors. If the plane falls, drops to the sky, I need to rush from row 23 to row 18. I'm in the window seat. I need to get past two kids sitting on my right. Should I go forward or back? If the aisle is packed, then what? Retreat to my seat, cling, swing, window shade to window shade to safety, climb over seats, What's the best path? I underline escape three times. And inside the book, you can actually see Addie's drawing of the airplane, trying to figure what she would do if she had to escape and survive. On to the next slide, please, Shane. Here we go. There have been nearly 5,000 fires in California since the start of 2018. The fire season has the been- The sound bumped. might come on, but if it doesn't, you can read the Another record-setting fire season. Now the largest in state history. Really, there's no end in sight. It's hot, it's dry, it's windy. Just about everything on the ground is flammable. But there's one thing that's consistently making wildfires in California worse and worse and worse. <laughs> Uh, at this point, even calling them wildfires might be a misnomer because most of them are not natural. Humans are responsible for starting a whopping 84% of them. The Northern California car fire, for example, was started by sparks from a car tire's rim. And in Southern California, the Holy Fire, just outside of LA, started after a suspected arson. These are just two of the fires currently active in the state. So far in 2018, 629,000 acres have burned. That's nearly three times as much compared to the same time period in 2017. What makes these fires so dangerous, damaging, and therefore costly is that more human-made infrastructure is getting caught in the flames. This map highlights the parts of California most prone to fires, and it's no surprise that, yeah, that's where these fires are. But compare it to this map, which shows population density growth projections. Put them together, and it's clear. California's population is growing out from urban centers directly into the areas at the highest risk for fire. Meanwhile, the state is spending more and more to fight fires each year, as more and more people move into areas that put them in harm's way. It's up to all of us to protect and preserve the forests we have. So, since we made this mess worse, what can we do? That's a good job. 
said Smokey the Bear. Being mindful of how we spark these fires is a good start. But the bigger problems contributing to this, like man-made climate change, are unlikely to reverse. And despite the risks, humans keep moving into these areas. Fire's creeping real, real close to some residences up here. By 2050, another 645,000 houses will be built at areas at very high risk for wildfire. We have the opportunity to get out of the way of wildfires and let nature run its course. But will we? Only you can prevent forest fires. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about California's wildfires, check out the Verge's Science Channel. They did a great video explaining some of the other causes as to why the wildfire season is so long. Thank you, Shane. We can go to the next slide. <laughs> and actually, this slide is a paradise, California. And this is a town that actually inspired my novel paradise we think of it being perfect beautiful you know a home beyond compare and yet the entire town of paradise burned down they were told about the fire risks um, they were told that they didn't have enough risk management if you look you can see how the streets are so narrow uh, that it made it difficult for fire trucks and people to escape um, and to, you know, get out of the way of the wildfire. And it really just devastated everything. Uh, paradise no longer exists. So part of my book is about trying to remind us how we have a responsibility to take care of nature. And I think also to consider whether we ought to be building in places that given climate change have high risk for fire because of the drought. It's like adding a tinder, you know, striking a match um, and you can't predict what's going to happen. Next slide, Shane. Now, another big fire fight, wildfire happened in Australia um, and it happens on every year, but last year in particular was terrible. They call them the Australian bushfires. And there actually was a time where, you know, they had the great bushfire and they had hundreds upon hundreds of people die and thousands upon thousands of animals also die. Now, Australia is having wildfires just like people in California are having it because of the drought because of the drying of our planet, that anything, but particularly human activity, can spark a fire. So if you think that wildfires are just a California problem, nope, it's a worldwide global problem. Next slide. Now there is another rainforest wildfire that's going ongoing. The Amazon, and you can ask your teachers to help you look up the Amazon on the map. It covers primarily a lot of countries in South America, but primarily Brazil. And you can see this one photo that in October, um, you know, it's green. It's filled with all kinds of, you know, glorious and wondrous trees. But a few months later, there are red spots, and that's where they have cut down the trees. The current Brazilian president, in fact, ran on the idea that they would use the rainforest to make money. You know, they would cut it down so they could have cattle graze. The problem is, is that the Amazon rainforest, or all forests for that matter, but particularly the Amazon rainforest, it helps the dampen the CO2, the sort of the poison within our oxygen, that they actually take out pollution, the trees take out pollution and make the air healthier and cleaner. So some people call the Amazon rainforest the planet's lungs. So just as you have lungs that help you breathe, the Amazon rainforest with its wide, you know, swath of acres upon acres of forest actually helps keep our planet cooler and helps our earth breathe. So there's more and more concern that shortly we won't have our lungs and that'll make climate change even worse. Next video, Shane. 
Oh, look at the picture now. You can just see more Amazon rainforest deforestation. And now Shane's going to go back to, to the video for me by the BBC. Thank you. Brazilian officials have told the BBC that there's been an aggressive increase in deforestation since the election of President Bolsonaro in January. An area of Amazon rainforest roughly the size of a football pitch is now being cleared every minute. The rainforest, which plays a vital role in regulating the Earth's climate, covers an area 20 times the size of Britain. Nearly two thirds of it is in Brazil. Crucially, it absorbs billions of tons of carbon dioxide every year and produces 20% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. In the first of a series of reports, our science editor, David Shipman, has been to see how decades of conservation efforts are being reversed. The rich greens of the most vibrant habitat on Earth. The billions of trees store so much carbon, they help to slow down global warming. They're also home to an amazing tenth of all species in the natural world. Some unnerving, Others adorable. But the sight of bare earth and dead trunks is becoming more common, with huge tracts of forest wiped out. My footsteps and distant bird song are the only sounds. It's tragic to see this close up. To bring these trees down to the ground, they just knock them over with a bulldozer. This is happening all over the Amazon to create new farmland. And the result is that the great forest has never been under such pressure. Over the decades, field by field, many trees have made way for agriculture. But that's set to speed up because of a massive push for development. The new president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, was elected on a promise to exploit the Amazon. He's delighted his supporters by saying too much of the forest is protected. His environment officials are deeply worried, but he's banned them from saying anything in public. You're trying to save the forest. So we have to meet this official in secret. His face hidden and voice changed. He says the government is trying to cover up the loss of the forest. Eles não querem que a gente fale porque nós vamos falar a verdade. Nós vamos falar que as unidades de conservação estão sendo invadidas, estão sendo destruídas. Há muitas pessoas fazendo marcações de lotes de propriedades rurais dentro de áreas que deveriam estar sendo protegidas. E os números de desmatamento aumentam, mas poderiam ser ainda maiores. And the scale of the deforestation he describes is staggering. Up here at the top of this 50 meter high observation tower, the view is just phenomenal. Out over what looks like a great ocean of green. This is the canopy of the largest rainforest in the world. The problem is that more and more of it is being chopped down. It's hard to believe, but an area the size of a football pitch is being cleared every single minute. What that means is that forest that could cover more than 2,000 pitches is just vanishing every day. And all the signs are that this rate of devastation will accelerate. Cattle are the biggest single reason the trees are cleared. They're grazing on land that used to be forest. Brazilian beef is in big demand all over the world. And the president's vision of expanding agriculture here has delighted the farmers. Like Vandele Wegner, who says other countries cut their forest down long ago. Nós temos que desenvolver a Amazônia, né? Porque vamos supor aqui na região do Baixo Amazonas, na região de Santarém, vive mais de 4 milhões de pessoas. Então, se precisa ter um desenvolvimento também, é um direito constitucional. Farming on an industrial scale has already reached the Amazon, but the government wants to see more of it. And to weaken the laws protecting the forest. We asked to interview two ministers about this, but they both refused. A line often heard here is that only Brazil can decide what to do with the forest, no one else. But the fact is, the more trees are cut down, the more we lose one of the few things holding back the rise in global temperatures. So what happens here in the coming years matters far beyond Brazil. David Schuchman, BBC News, in the Amazon. It's time to picture your business on TV. Thank you so much, Shane. Uh, we can go to the next slide, making maps. Thank you. Um, 
it's really interesting because, you know, everything on our planet is interconnected. So wildfires or intentional burning of the Amazon rainforest will affect the entire globe. What happens in California is affecting the entire globe. What happens in Australia is affecting the entire globe. And if we have a planet without forests, we will literally, in a very real sense, have a dying planet. Um, that we will be cast on that sort of notion of unable to sustain animal life and human life, not in the so near future, but eventually it will snowball. So one of the things that we need are climatologists. We need engineers. We need map makers who can then keep track of what we have and think about forest management and wildfire management. And so Addie's skill at being able to make maps and mazes is actually very important to the future. And her name is Aduago, which is actually Nigerian for daughter of an eagle, that Maddie likes to see things from above, like an eagle says, you see above, like making the map. And here's a scene where Addie is with Leo, who is the man who owns the Wilderness Adventure Camp, and he um, and his dog Ryder talks to Maddie, Addie, about making maps. You all right, Adago? I feel Ryder, the dog, twisting his body and head to look at Leo. I'm not ready to look at Leo yet. Ryder's rising and falling chest, his heart beating, make me know I've stopped dreaming. Like a big kid, Leo crosses his legs, sits on the ground. I can't help smiling. Ryder relaxes, lying down between us. I've brought you this, a sketch pad, and these, pens and colored pencils held together with a rubber band. You can draw the trails, Addie. Thank you. I flip to a blank page. I want to tell him what I think, but I'm nervous and he'll think I'm complaining. I hear BB saying, truth telling is healing. Sometimes though, I don't know what the truth is. I'm carrying a secret even I can't figure out. I just have instincts, warnings, a need to be prepared. Trails are just paths worn down and people following them over and over, I say. Navigating off path in the wild is different. Wilderness isn't like an apartment or building with windows and doors and hallways. It flows. Rocks to brush to forests, streams to hills. No pass, no footsteps. Ryder sits, snuffling. He knows I'm upset. There was a fire, I blurt. My parents died. I survived. I don't remember how I did. I was a little kid, and Bebe, your grandmother, says I'll remember my spirit's journey, like me traveling here. She says the spirit takes journeys too. You just need to get ready. Yes, you understand. I leaned forward, Ryder shifts closer. Leo strokes Ryder. That's why you like maps. Yes, if I can see the layout, map it, I think I can always escape, survive. Maybe I figured it out as a kid. Maybe my parents taught me, showed me how to escape earlier. I don't know. I was so little. My voice cracks, chokes. Now there's only me and Bibi. And she's old, really, really old. Leo nods, knowing what I'm trying to say. I swallow. My map works in the Bronx, but I can't make them work here. No streets, corners. I can't plot my escape. You need to understand topographical maps. And so Leo starts teaching and mentoring her how to draw the maps. And all that knowledge will help Addie get to safety and survive the wildfire. So thank you.
Any questions or conversations? Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Cliff. And we are both muted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Jewel, thank you so much for an incredible presentation. It, I mean, reading the book was phenomenal and I felt like really was benefited by a lot of the information from the presentation. So just thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Absolutely wonderful. Oh, it's fantastic. I loved it. It is, and it is, um, it's good to have all the context. You, we see the wildfires on the news. It's been Thing. But yeah, you put together a, a great presentation. Okay, well, thank you, very, oh. thank you very much. And all the things in that presentation are really touched upon in the book. So one of the things that I have to do as a writer, if you don't have the videos or maybe you live in Missouri and you don't have wildfires, is try to convey lots of information in the book, but not convey it in a way that one, you can't understand it, but also two, that it's not dramatic, that it doesn't come out of the experience of the characters. And actually this story is based on real city kids that I met in Wyoming. I was in Wyoming and I saw a, a group of black kids who were um, listening to me give a talk. And Wyoming is pretty much like 99% white. You know, it doesn't have a lot of diversity. It's not like say a St. Saint, Saint Louis. So I went to meet the kids and they were part of a program called City Kids Wilderness Adventures. And when they were in the sixth grade, they were picked to be part of this program. And they stay in this program from sixth grade all the way until they graduate from high school. And they learn camping, they learn hiking, they learn horseback riding, they learn river rafting, they learn all these, what seemed to them strange skills. And that was the inspiration in part for Paradise on Fire. And then also the loss of what happened to the real paradise in California. So I mashed those two together to make an exciting survival adventure story, I hope. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I will say it is very engaging. It's very fun. It's uh, fun is a, a, a weird word to use, but it was a great read for sure. Thank you. For those students out there, if you, if you like hatchets, um, Hatchet by Gary Paulson in adventure survival stories like I Survive, Wildfires, you know, that by Lauren Tarnish uh, and others. Um, I think you will really like this book. But one of the things that happens in our literature is that the survival stories will also be just about, you know, a white boy. And that's fine. But all kinds of kids all over the world in America have opportunities to learn skills. And so I like having Addie a girl, and I like having Addie an African-American, African girl, you know, be the one that really is the key to survival. But she has five other friends and they're all pretty cool and all, all very different. Um, so yeah, I, I admire Addie. I wish I could be more like her. I was going to ask if you like, um, because Addie is a very brave and a very uh, kind of courageous character and she develops that kind of throughout the book. So I was wondering if you also consider yourself to be brave and courageous because I'm not brave and courageous. I, I'm not, you know, if I, if my family was threatened, I would be very brave, you know, but in general, my tendency is that I'm, I'm a little bit, whoa, because like of the city kids in this book, I grew up in a poor community in Pittsburgh. So I didn't learn how to swim. I had never been to a national park. So the idea that you would sleep outside, that's crazy. You know, I didn't know about fire or how to climb or do canoeing or any of that. Uh, but I married um, a man who did know all that stuff. And he taught our kids. And I saw how it really made a difference in our kids life, you know, and in particular, my daughter was a Girl Scout. And Girl Scouting and Boy Scouting can be wonderful, but I my own personal experiences with the Girl Scouting and that my uh, daughter went on all kinds of hikes and trails and overnight camps, and she learned a lot of important skills that strengthened her self-esteem. And we were worried one day about a family member who was uh, in the 
path of a hurricane. And they showed the highway of all these cars that were bumper to bumper trying to get out of Miami. And my daughter just had her little girl. And she said to me, Mom, I would just get out of that car, strap my daughter to my back, and we would hike out of there. And that's a kind of Girl Scout wilderness Addie spirit, you know, it's sort of like, okay, I can do it myself, you know, I can find a creative way to survive. And I just, I just love that. Lanisha in Ninth Ward is very much like that too, that she finds creative ways to survive Hurricane Katrina. Anyway, but no, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't, well, I, I have hiked and, and I've kayaked. Um, and even though I've taken swimming classes, when my husband takes me to snorkeling, he has to hold my hand and I wear my life vest. <laughs> I still get scared. So it's just, I want to encourage you as young people to get out there in nature. Ask your parents to take you camping, you know, take, take you hiking, that there really is beauty to be found there. And did you know there's a thing called nature bathing? That in Japan, they actually have you know, trips where you just go bathe in nature, that you, if you go to nature 30 minutes a day, it literally helps depression. It makes you feel better about yourself and the world. It's tremendous, you know? So there's also this inequity that if you live in a city, there's not a lot of nature sometimes. And particularly if you're in a poor community, there might even be fewer trees, no parks to play in. So the novel is also a shout out and a call that we need to have more nature, you know, not necessarily just the big parks, but nature of, you know, more trees, more pathways, more biking trails for kids to enjoy. Because if you don't know nature and learn to love it, then you might miss the opportunity to take care of it. Yeah. Do you want to do some questions from some students? Oh. Uh, so we have a question from Allie in the Groves classroom asking, how did you feel writing your first book for kids? Oh, I felt so special, Allie. Um, actually, I, I had thought about, okay, I'm going to write a book about Hurricane Katrina, you know, for kids. But it still took like a year and a half before, oh, sorry about that, just about a year and a half before the character came to me. I can't write a book until the character comes to me. And so a year and a half after Katrina, hurricane, another hurricane was coming, barreling down the waterways to, towards New Orleans. And I went to bed and I had a nightmare. It was like, oh no, New Orleans can't have, you know, another storm. And then I woke up and there Lanisha was, the character. And the whole first two pages of Ninth Ward they just poured out of me and I never ever once changed, changed them. And I kept it a secret even from my family that I was writing my first children's book and I would go off to Starbucks Bucks and write. And I never went to Starbucks and wrote before, but I think it was like so special and so sacred that I wanted to keep it a secret. And then when I was done, I shared it with my family and I shared it with my agent, but I felt as though I had won the jackpot. The thing that I wanted to do for my whole life was finally happening. So ninth board, writing for kids. Uh, I actually Thank did. Uh, I drove a truck of supplies from St. Louis down to Houma, Louisiana for that. Uh, and that was the first time I had ever experienced the aftermath of a hurricane because in St. Louis, we don't get wildfires. We don't get hurricanes. We get tornadoes and yes, yes, um, very damaging thunderstorms as well, which we've had a couple of those recently. Um, so it, it's a different thing to witness and to experience a disaster of that scale. Absolutely. You know, actually, uh, for all of you, you know, um, disasters, you know, are part of you know the natural environment. But uh, scientists believe that climate change is making disasters even worse and all kinds of strange things are happening. So you might be getting more flooding in St. Louis, more crazy tornadoes. But in some sense, I'm trying to deal with, well, what if you have 
you know, a hurricane and flooding? What if you have a, a BP oil spill, which Louisiana also had? I wrote about that in Bayou Magic. What if you have a fire firestorm or, um, but it could easily be an, a tornado. When I was raising my kids, I was in the Northridge earthquake and it was like somebody had dropped a bomb on our house. And for days, our children wouldn't speak, you know, and the dogs went crazy. It was like they knew before it happened that something was going to happen to the earth. So one of the things that the newscasters do or parents will talk about is that disasters only, you know, have, affect adults. But that's not true. Kids have to be strong have to be resilient, you know? Animals need help to survive. So I think that all of these disasters are linked and that they're gonna become more frequent and we actually will need all you young people to grow up and help us manage them better. But also don't forget, you know, when you're an adult, that there are children that need to be taken care of, animals that need to be protected too, that they are vulnerable. And also people who are disabled or people who are elderly, you know. I went to one school in Baton Rouge after the hurricane and it was a school for the deaf. And so they were doing documentaries and signing and they were showing how, you know, being deaf was such a severe handicap in terms of, you know, the, the, the flooding, you know, that it became almost impossible that when people were shouting warnings, you know, or directing people where to go, they literally couldn't hear and that impacted their survival. So anybody that you can think of that's vulnerable from, you know, your cat, your dog, your, your grandparents, you know, somebody who might be disabled in your family or in your community, you know, all of those people in particular need help to survive disasters. Yeah, absolutely. My goodness. Um, we have another student question, if you are open to it. Okay. Uh, Stella wants to know, what is your favorite book genre and how do you get your ideas for stories? Oh, Stella, thank you. Um, I'm actually more an historical novelist, even though some of the history might just be like, um, you know, two summers ago with Paradise on Fire, you know, or 20 years ago with the towers falling in nine in the 9-11, that in general, I like mixing history with contemporary characters and contemporary times. It excites me intellectually, and it also excites me emotionally, but it fits in with my African-American culture, and I think really all people's culture, that if we don't honor the past or know the past, then we might create the same mistakes, you know? Like, for example, one of the reasons why uh, the hurricane most recently in New Orleans wasn't as devastating as it could be is because they fixed the levees, you know, that they've used technology to make the city, the city safer. So they learn from the mistakes of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, so I, I, I get research from events that happen in the newspaper or people tell me about things. Um, and then I go and visit those places. And actually for Katrina, I had a book come out for adults the day the hurricane hit. And my bookseller, my publisher sent me to New Orleans two weeks later, which was crazy because the town was devastated. And I got to see it firsthand. Sometimes too, I think that having survived an earthquake when I was a young mom uh, with my kids and my dogs, that I think I'm particularly clued into when, when bad things happen in nature and its effect upon people. So all of that sort of excites and interests me. I'm curious with, because they did correct the levee systems and uh, improve them to hopefully prevent further disasters like Hurricane Katrina. Do you have opinions as to why they possibly haven't done what is necessary and needed to fix the systems of that have caused the devastating wildfires? Uh, actually, one of the things um, uh, that I wanted to point out and I forgot, uh, in the example of the Australian wildfires, the native people of Australia, the Aborigines, uh, they had been managing their forests for like eons, you know, thousands upon thousands of years. And what they would do is that they would have controlled burns where they would burn, you know, and thin out the forest 
and then the rest of the forest would grow. And then, you know, a couple years later, they would burn and thin out the forest so that you didn't have these sort of like clumps of trees all together. Interestingly enough, when the Aborigines stopped being in control of their land, when Western modern society started controlling the forest, they stopped using those techniques. And I think even in California, because they have so many people who have houses in areas where all these trees are, they stopped doing enough controlled burns. And so there's also a movement in America and in California to go back to the native peoples and you know use the resources that they use to control fires. So I think it's sometimes because we have planes that can drop plane retardants and we have all this technology, we think, oh, we can we can control anything. But clearly we need, I think, systematic moments where we create fires to clean out all the brush. So um, right now I have a we have five acres in Port Townsend and we have all kinds of trees and we cleared out a lot of them, but we, now we're going back to clear out all the little bush brush and and weeds and things in between the teeth trees because that helps make the fire spread from one tree to the next. So we are literally with our home in this forest area, making it so that we can guard against the wildfire. So I think we need to go back to our native and our Aboriginal resources, native sort of more of organic ways of doing forest wildfires. Um, because this is a, this is a creation of, of, of modern modern times. Um, that topic was actually brought up because I read your book and loved it. I um, have been reading other news articles. The sequoia uh, forest is actually under threat right now, and they brought up yeah they, um, they are very concerned about uh, some of the great monarch um, sequoia trees, and yeah. they brought up the controlled wildfires and the indigenous people and yeah. how they had protected these trees for thousands of years, and we are not doing our. For those of you who are in school, you know, you might ask your teacher or yourself, look up the sequoia. I think they have one giant tree, one giant sequoia tree that might be the oldest tree in America. I'm not sure about it, or the oldest sequoia. And today I saw a picture that they were wrapping the, tr the tree in flame retardant wrapping, that they were trying no matter what to save this one tree. So think about it, something that has lived for thousands upon thousands of years, who's like maybe a tree, it's, it's, its trunk might be as big as a house and goes all up to the sky. Can you imagine in a blink of an eye of it burning to the ground? And they are trying to save in particular this one tree, but all the sequoias. Yeah. And the sequoias are naturally, like they have developed this uh, ability to survive wildfires. That actually is part of how they reproduce. Well, I didn't hear that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Um, they, when the wildfires happen, that actually causes the seeds to drop and for more. Mm -hmm. So it, it, like wildfires are part of how they like exist, how they have been able to survive. Yes. And it's, they're fascinating. Oh, I'm going to do more homework on that, Shane. Thank you for that, for that gift. That's one, that's wonderful. So yeah, that would be a really terrible irony if they were all destroyed when they coexisted with wildfires for thousands of years. I feel like I've been talking to Cliff, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I get so excited talking to you, Joel. It is wonderful. To you. Are uh, there any other questions? Yeah. Well, I have uh, some questions. Okay. Your dog's names. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Ripley uh, and Gurgi. And on the picture um, of me with my dogs, the one that's on the far right, I guess your far left, is Ripley. And well, here, I started, the one in my lap that I have my arm around, that's Gurgi. And Gurgi is actually named after a character in the Black Cauldron. It was a Disney movie and also it was a book um, by Lloyd Alexander, um, the, 
the rule of threes or I'm blanking out on it now. But anyway, it's a children's character where it's kind of like a, a cross between a pig and a troll. And Gurgi has bulging eyes and one is part blue. They're actually Australian sheepdogs, but they're toys. So they are like fully grown. And Ripley, the one who's sitting off on the far, far right, looking, looking at me, she was named for Ripley, my the heroine in the Aliens movie. And see, I always love Ripley, played by Sigourney Weaver, as a strong woman, you know, who saves her, the, the little girl from the, the aliens. But my Ripley is so sweet. She's more like a teacup princess. She's just like, she like goes up to every stranger and says, oh, I love you, you know, pat me, give me some love. You know, she's nothing like a tough Ripley. But we were on a vacation and the dogs got out of the house. And I got to scream like one of the soldiers does in the Ripley's in, in the Aliens 2 movie, Ripley, Ripley, you know, for my Ripley, I want to save you. And my little dog came running. So I have Ripley. Oh. So, yes. <laughs> Gergie's name is the only one that fits. But Ripley, when I gave my call, like when the soldier calls for Ripley, Ripley, slow down, Ripley, she came to me. But those are my, my dogs. And we take walks and I walk, when I walk my dogs, I get a lot of ideas or it helps me think about stories. And Gurgi in particular will stay near me while I'm writing. That she's very like, I wanna be close to you, you know? And Ripley is usually laying on her back like this on whatever cool spot she can find in the, in the house. But I've always had dogs, I've always had cats, We've also had boa constrictors. Um, we've also had birds. We've also had hamsters. Uh, growing up, the kids had lots of animals and fish, uh, freshwater and saltwater fish. But all of our sort of uh, mammal animals, we actually have saved all of their ashes. And when we get our new new house built, we're going to make a little cemetery for them because those animals gave us so much love during our children's childhood and during our lifetime. Um, and they are, they, are not, they are not forgotten. So for me, uh, if I had my brothers, you know, uh, maybe dogs, dogs and cats and things should live as long as people. Yeah, and absolutely. People should live as long as some of the trees. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, I was, I was going to ask if you were able to share some of the incredible news that you shared with Cliff and I ahead oh. of the event. Well, students, I don't know if you've had a chance to read Ghost Boys, but Ghost Boys is going to be made into a film uh, with Studio Entertainment that was announced in August. And then most recently, my other novel, Black Brother, Black Brother, about fencing, and that's because I like swords, I always have, um, is going to be made into a film with unanimous media, uh, which is Steph Curry's um, um, film company. And I'm really excited because I didn't know very much about basketball. And when we moved to California for my birthday, my husband took me to uh, a basketball game and I got to see Steph Curry live. And I thought he was the bee's knees. I thought he was wonderful. But that's the only basketball game or basketball player that I've seen sort of like up close in the stands. So that's going to, so two movies and they might both come out next year or one next year and one the year after. Fantastic. Congratulations, my goodness. Thank That's you. such good news. Thank you very so much. Excited. Thank you. You will also find on YouTube teachers, um, uh, Itabaji Muhammad was the first African American Muslim fencer, first person ever to fence in a hijab. And she won bronze at the uh, Rio Olympics. And so she interviews me and we talk about fencing and the book for Steph Curry's book club uh, that's part of Literati. And so there's actually a video of us talking on the YouTube channel. But fencing, well, just as though when you go to national parks, um, you don't see many kids of color. And in fact, the national parks are trying a campaign to get more kids of color to come into the nation's parks and particularly state parks because there are things that you can enjoy and learn there. So to fencing, people often thought it was an aristocratic, you know, rich white person's sport. 
And yet there was a fellow named Peter Westbrook in America who was a black guy who won Meadows decades ago that started a school in New York to teach fencing free. And most of the Olympic champions that have we've had in the past, you know, 12 years have been African American or Hispanic or Dominican students who came out of his school in Itabaji Muhammad as, you know, a Muslim girl, she came from his school and went on to Olympic fame. So I like also opening up horizons. I think every kid should be able to do everything if they want, you know, or be able to see everything or every kid should be able to travel the world or go to the parks or learn all kinds of sports, you know? So you wanna do hockey, why not, you know? Um, so I'm really in my books trying to bring other experiences that maybe you haven't experienced or maybe you have, but all the time I keep changing because I'm just trying to do my books to get you to live other ways of being in the world and to be realizing that there are other opportunities, other places for you to go and see. And I grew up on the East Coast in cities that were similar, say, to St. Louis, you know, and I came to Seattle, Washington, where I am right now, when I was doing my first novel, uh, Voodoo Dreams, and I remember seeing all these huge mountains that at the very tops were covered in snow and all these bays of water and then the ocean and all this green it was gorgeous and immediately like Addie does when she goes to California it was like a call to my heart and I said to myself I could live here this is my landscape and it took me nearly 40 years to finally get here and live in the place in the world that I discovered almost sort of like happenstance is the place that I feel happiest being. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's great. Right. Well, I want to remind everyone watching that we do have signed copies of Paradise on Fire. Cliff and I cannot recommend this book oh. like enough. Like I absolutely oh. loved it, Jewel. You are Thank you. brilliant. Oh, it Thank you so much. Oh, yes, that, means, that means so much to me. You guys, as students, you know, when you do something that you really, you know, it really means a lot to you. And then you get kind of nervous because you wonder whether the world would like it. That's how I feel all the time with my books. So your great booksellers at Left Bank Books have made me, made my day by saying, oh, you, you, you know, we like it. You know, it's like, oh, yes, because it means so much to me. But they've also made my day because even though I can't see you, I can feel you. And I promise you, as soon as I am able, I'm going to ask Shane and Cliff to bring me to your schools so I can see you guys in person. I'm sending you my love always. And I'm so privileged and honored to write for you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Uh, well, I want to wish everyone a happy rest of your day, a happy weekend. If you are watching this in the future, uh, <laughs> thank you so much for supporting Left Bank Books and Jewel. Really, Thank just you. such Thank an you. endless pleasure. Like Thank you. Oh, you guys, oh. <laughs> now you'll give me the strength to go when I go to write today and I go, ah, ah, ah. And I say, okay, Jane and Cliff said, oh, this was good. So, okay, I can keep, yeah. I can keep at it. Yeah, so, positive reinforcement. <laughs> you see you as inspiration. And I hope I get to see you both very soon in person. Thanks for the honor and give my best to the, you know, Left Bank Books staff, owner, you know, all everybody there. Tell them that you have always and always will be an important part of my sort of writer's journey. And I appreciate that. See you later, alligators. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>